Hey there! Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Dreaming of a better sleep? Tossing and turning is not your destiny. And Ollie is here to help. Ollie invites you to sink into sweet, sweet slumber to improve your mental and physical health and overall wellness. More than just melatonin, Ollie's ingredients help you unwind your mind for a delightfully dreamy drift off. Sleep is on the way at Ollie.com. That's O L L Y.com. Welcome to MuggleCast, your weekly ride into the Wizarding World fandom. This week, the ladies of MuggleCast are back to round out Women's History Month with another MuggleCast Girls Takeover. Hello, ladies. It's so good to have y'all here. Hello. Hello. Just to remind everyone, we have Chloe, uh, the one and only, who is the MuggleCast social media manager. Hi, friends. We have Meg, who has taken on the enormous task of getting MuggleCast transcribed. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Meg. And we have Pam, who is my millennial bestie um, over co-hosting Millennial Podcast with me and Andrew. It's so great to have all of you back. It's nice to be back. Thank you for spending your Friday night with me. Nowhere we would rather be, honestly. Anytime, babe. (laughs) Thanks to people in the server for coming to hang out with us, too. Like, yeah, true. y'all could be anywhere, but you're here with us. Oh. So. It's because it's a freaking party, Pam. Well, I thought that we could check in a little bit after the first installment of Girls Muggle Cast. By the way, just wanted to say we got so much great feedback about that episode. We're still hearing yes. from people about it, right, Chloe? We did. Oh, really? Yes. That's so nice. Everyone loved it. They were big fans. People are, you know, uh, if you go to our Instagram, you'll see the comments. People are saying that it was like their favorite episode. I think a lot of women felt really seen by this. And my favorite comment that really stood out was, um, I didn't know how badly I needed this. And the little, like the teenager in me in 2005 is so happy. And this makes my heart happy. And I was like, oh, I'm so that. glad like it's it was just so much fun and the vibes were so good at everything like our girls night that we had with our patrons was amazing and the episode was so fun for sure well we obviously had a really in-depth but also fun and lighthearted at times conversation about the representation of women in Harry Potter but i was wondering before we jump into this part 2 installment of that discussion have we had any reflections since we did our last installment together? Or have we noticed anything new about our interpretations on the topic? I've definitely been aware of it a lot, especially as MuggleCast has been doing Gobble to Fire chapter by chapter. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like we talked a lot about how uh, (laughs) the author writes about femininity. And it's so evident in characters like Fleur and Madame Maxime and Rita Skeeter. And so to see all that happen as we're rereading Goblet of Fire is just like, oh, we talked about that. Oh, we talked about that. Even little things like when McGonagall scolds Parvati for having like a butterfly clip in her hair. Little things like yeah. that where you're mm-hmm. like, why Why the shaming of fun, fun 90s accessories? Yeah. Yeah. The, what are the only examples of a 90s accessory, by the way? Like they should all be wearing like baggy pants and like grunge clothing mm-hmm. and, you know, but chokers. <laughs> the butterfly clip was the one thing. Yeah. Proof that Harry Potter was set in the 90s. Exactly. Exactly. I, I think one thing that is really actually since our conversation, which really honestly healed a part of me, I think, um, finally being able to actually talk about this with women that, you know, know Harry Potter in depth even more than I do. And like, it just was so special. And one thing I actually 
realized when I was preparing for this conversation is that there is a lot that I like about the writing of women. And I feel like last time I was like really you know, upset. And I, I aired out my grievances, especially with like Flo and like a few of the other characters. But this time I, I really thought about it. And a lot of these women became like role models of mine, or at least women I aspired to be like. So I'm excited to like really dive into that. Yeah, I'm with Meg. I think Goblet of Fire, having the perspective of our All Girls episode, it just put um, a different lens on Goblet of Fire. And you guys had me on a few weeks ago for a chapter by chapter, and I'm nothing if not an over preparer. So I ended up reading all 19 chapters, and then yeah. I kept going because I forgot how much I love. Goblet of Fire it's is so, so good. Book. It's like it's so easy to get sucked in, and it, you know what? I'll tell you too. Like Goblet of Fire is not even like my favorite book, really. So I was surprised by how much I enjoyed it, which is why I just kept reading. Um, but then also just like the. <laughs> What was really put into perspective for me was just how um, one dimensional Mm -hmm. sometimes women are in the sense that, you know, we were talking a lot about how women are only Mm -hmm. allowed to be one thing at a time often in terms of the plot. And I feel like that really gets put into perspective Mm -hmm. with Hermione when Ron is um, not talking to Harry and a lot of Harry's lament is that Hermione is no fun and all they do is go to the library and it's like I'm sure Hermione can be fun she's just like she's got to get stuff done first you know but it was interesting that like that was the point that just kept getting hammered home like that he missed Ron because Hermione was no fun and all she wanted to do was study and- yeah and someone made some point after that episode about how um maybe Harry isn't having as many laughs with Hermione, but she's the one like kicking his ass into gear being like, you're in a tournament where you might die. Let's go learn some magic. Yeah. yeah. Again, the reason he survives and Hermione absolutely, I think, can be fun. I think the issue is that we don't see that side with the women. Like they don't, maybe they're not allowed to be fun just because they are wrangling the men in the series a lot of the time. I feel like that also... um not to get too ahead of ourselves, I feel like that transitions really nicely into some of the discussion topics you guys came up with for us today. Because, you know, like Hermione is mothering Harry for a lot of the stint of the Triwizard Tournament, which makes sense because like he needs somebody to be in his corner. And the way that manifests for her is trying to take care of him. She's being, you know, the mom friend, making sure that he's you know, prepared and he doesn't die, you know, she has a vested interest. But the way that that manifests is in such a motherly way. And she believes him. Yeah, she's she does. Yep. She believes yeah. him. That's the bigger thing. <laughs> she's like, of course you did it. And she never she never doubted him once. Right. She is the only student at Hogwarts who believes him at this point in time. And Harry isn't not to say that You know, I think he doesn't value that, but I think he's not thinking about it because he misses Ron that much. And I also, you know, I want to just offer a disclaimer here. I don't think it's terrible that Harry longed for aspects of his friendship that he could only get with Ron. Agreed. I I think anytime we go through this, like you'll feel something like that really acutely. Um, And the result of it is it can cause you to inadvertently disrespect the person who is there supporting you and giving you what you need in the moment, even if what you need isn't what you want. Oof. Yeah, he just wanted an escape, too, I think. Yeah. And I think that that's what Ron would have offered. You know, if he had been there, he would have been like, don't worry about the task, Carrie. Let's just go have fun. Right. Well, we all need different things from our friends. Mm -hmm. That's why we have different friends in our life. And Hermione serves a very different purpose for Harry than Ron does. And Pam, you're so right. Like Ron is escapism for him. And Hermione is always the person that brings him back to reality. I also think Hermione is the only person with any reality in Goblet of Fire, at least at the beginning. She's understanding the weight of this. Mm-hmm. You know, the fact that he could actually die. Ron's just mad that it's not him. Meanwhile, Hermione's like, our friend could die. So now I need to help him in any way possible. And meanwhile, Harry's just like miserable. Yeah. <laughs> and like talk about foreshadowing too for Deathly Hollows because the same we see the same thing happen again is Ron decides to leave and he's upset he doesn't understand that she's staying because he could die and he needs help yep 
Well, I feel like that is a really good transition for us. It really sets us up to move into the beginning of our discussion, which is looking at the specific thematic roles of women in Harry Potter. And in having this discussion, I think we're going to talk a little bit more about some characters we didn't get to focus on very much last time. So I'm pretty excited about that. Um, And Chloe, I I think there's a perspective that you take to this discussion as well. Well, I just I love that we're talking about the older women in this series. I feel like they're not talked about enough. And we definitely focused, I'd argue, on the younger women in the series during our first discussion, Mm -hmm. because we see more of them. We see more of Hermione and Luna and Ginny. Um, But these older women are not talked about enough. They're so powerful and they bring so much to the table. And I also know that our listeners were asking for this. So I'm excited that, you know, we can talk about it for them as well. Well, we're talking about Hermione basically mothering Harry. So let's first talk about the roles of women as mothers in the Harry Potter series. So Think about characters, and and this certainly isn't an exhaustive list, but I think it's probably some of the more uh, poignant representations that we didn't get to spend a ton of time on. So we have Lily, Molly, Narcissa, Bellatrix, Petunia, Andromeda, Merope, and Alice as examples that we can draw from in this conversation. And I thought it would be interesting, instead of speaking specifically about how these women show up as mothers, it could be... Um, interesting to focus on what other roles these women serve, or do they serve another role apart from being a mother? Uh, And I wanted to focus first on Merope. She was someone who I hadn't thought about in a while. And I actually went back and read um, some of the chapters in Half-Blood Prince in preparation for this episode. And I was really struck by how her story is really just tragedy her the other the other role that she serves is she's just a very tragic character yeah there's obviously no justification for what she does to tom riddle senior um but it's easy to see why she was so desperate to find a way out of the poverty neglect and abuse that she'd experienced her entire life. Um, And ultimately, when Tom Riddle Sr. leaves her, she's without resources, said to be without magic, either by choice or not by choice. And she's ultimately got this diminished ability to care for her son and care for herself and ultimately leads to her son being left in an orphanage and and she dies. I will say, though, I thought that that was an active almost bravery from real like sure as someone who is adopted and you know whose mother whose birth mother did die I think that it was her last act of motherhood and it was the last thing she ever did she went to that orphanage to give birth because she knew like she knew she wasn't going to survive she knew she was wasn't going to make it and she was like okay well at least this will give my child you know a place to stay and food, you know? And honestly, as miserable as that orphanage is, it was a better way to grow up than the way she did in that horrible, like, hovel with abuse, you know? Obviously, Tom Riddle um, Jr., who becomes Voldemort, is, you know, a nasty, nasty kid, but that has nothing to do with Marope, like, leaving him in an orphanage to hopefully be cared for. She didn't know that he was going to be, you know, the monster that he is. So I actually think that in her last moments, she was, you know, what she could what she could have been in terms of good mother. I have a question for you all, and I don't know if I have the right answer for this either, but, like, do you think that, like, if a timeline exists where she would have lived. Do you think that she even would have known how to love? Because so much of Voldemort's trajectory starts because he um, he has no love in his life and he is born out of Mm -hmm. um, a loveless coupling. Right. And so when you think about Merope's situation, you know, she didn't experience love from her family and she fabricates love for herself, but it's not real. So, like, would she even have been able to love him in some way? Because, like, when you look at the parallels, too, between, like, how 
what happens with Tom Riddle Jr. and what happens with Harry. Harry also goes to a loveless house, but he is like still like enveloped in the love that his parents had yeah. for him. And that's what ends up saving him in the end, right? You're right. Well, I, I think that, <laughs> I mean, I want to believe that Moreau could love just because she was raised in an abusive household where there was no love. I want to believe that Rope could have the capacity to. She was not conceived under a love potion to our knowledge, right? So she could still have the capacity to do it. And I wonder, you know, with her child, if if that last act was an act of love, an act of sacrifice and love, or like at least the only type of love that she's ever shown anyone else in her life. Something I'm thinking about is the act of naming her son. Mm -hmm. She names him specifically, she names him Tom for his father and Marvolo for her father. And so you you look at her as kind of a product of her circumstances growing in this this house with an abusive father and brother and not allowed to go to Hogwarts, not allowed to meet other people. But she still has this child and wants to give him a life better than what she had. Uh, and it's it's something to think about the fact that she picks a name for him after this this man who could not love her without a love potion and her father mm-hmm. who treated her horribly it's kind of like she i don't know was like thinking the, of how things could have been and wanting to just put some sort of idea of any familial love into into her child's future well, and I think that she probably didn't think very much of herself, right? I mean, think mm-hmm. about the way her father talked to her. And if she grew up with that and had no positive reinforcement or even like strong female reinforcement in her life, it would make sense that she would find very little value in herself. And see herself, to your point, Meg, as bestowing upon her child something that might make his life better than hers. And she doesn't know what a life better than hers looks like, but she she knows what her life looks like. So anything different has to be better, probably. Mm-hmm. I also wonder if naming him after her father and his father is maybe a connection that later he can find back to his family. You know, naming him Tom gave him that connection back to his father that he could potentially find later. And without her in the picture, maybe his dad would want to spend time with his kid. You know, there's like, I think a lot of mothers in desperate situations do try to leave some sort of connection there um, when they're not around. Yeah, she she tries to give him some sort of link to the past and Mm -hmm. it's it's an interesting what if to think like what if she hadn't given him a name and the orphanage didn't know her name and they said okay this is just a john doe kid and he went to hogwarts he wouldn't have been able to research his lineage he wouldn't have been able to find out that he was the son of a muggle um which enforced so much of his views on muggles um and he might have turned out very different. Couldn't mix up his name to Lord Voldemort. <laughs> exactly. But uh, also like a family that he, she admired, right? Like she admired the riddles for their strength and power in the muggle world. She grew up yeah. knowing that even though they were destitute, she came from a great lineage and it was a source of pride mm-hmm. for her mm-hmm. family. So she's literally setting him up to say like, hey, like I'm not here, but like you are, um, you come from great stock basically Mm -hmm. and really the the irony is she's giving him like a trail back to his father so he can go kill him yeah right right right. (laughs) marope's revenge (laughs) it sets this entire like tumble of what if you know if he wasn't named tom like it would be very very different all right we'll be back in a moment to continue our conversation about the role of women as mothers Andrew, jumping in for just a minute of this great episode to tell you that this show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Question for you. What's the first thing you would do if you had an extra hour in your day? Maybe read more of a book, go for a walk, get coffee with a friend, shop. 
a lot of us spend our lives wishing we had more time. The best way to squeeze that special thing that you've been wanting to do into your schedule is to know what's important to you and to make it a priority. Therapy can help you find what matters most to you so you can do more of it. This is why I love working with a therapist. You get to get out of your own head and get a valuable outside perspective whose only goal is to help you thrive. They'll help you prioritize the things going on in your life so you feel like you're living a well-balanced life. I'll give you a great example of this. My BetterHelp therapist helped me design a four-day work week last year. She encouraged me and lifted me up to make this big career change that I was worried about pursuing. She was the person in my corner who pushed me to do this thing that society often tells us we shouldn't do. No, you must work five days a week. My therapist was in my corner saying, Andrew, you deserve this four-day work week. Let's make this happen. If you're thinking of starting therapy to help you with your goals, give BetterHelp a try. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash MuggleCast today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash MuggleCast. Now that we've just finished talking about Merope, Merope. I'm like second guessing the appropriate pronunciation me because me, me and Chloe are saying it different. <laughs> I always said Merope. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Um, I'm sure they'll let us know. Yeah, yeah. What what is sure? Sure? Is it's, <laughs> it's not trying to call anybody out. I'm just sitting here being like Merope, 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 Merope. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of the audiobooks and it's just leaving me. <laughs> Well, you know, whatever. We're all friends here. We get it. Um, (laughs) So I thought it could be interesting to look at Bellatrix for a second on the heels of that (gasps) discussion. Because I just. Yeah, please. Go Can I just say when I saw this in the I was like, mother Bellatrix. (laughs) And then it all hit me at once in the face. And I was like, (gasps) she is a mother. It took me like my God to to be like. That's right. I know. And then that's Laura admitting that Cursed Child is canon. Ooh. She's taking it as canon. Yeah, I saw canon. that and I was like, oh, y'all accept Cursed Child here around these parts? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So here's the thing. It's not, I don't consider it pure canon. Mm. The original author didn't write it. <laughs> it can be elective canon. For the purpose of this discussion, yeah. it's more interesting. Yeah. It's yeah. Yeah. Think of the plots. Yeah, the she plot did have a blue-haired show. daughter, so that's pretty. Uh, epic. Yeah, kindred spirit for Laura, but that's where it dies. Like, yeah, just yeah. The sure. <laughs> Apparently, her daughter had wings. Or uh, honestly, y'all, I still haven't read Cursed Child, so I don't know. I barely remember it. Does Delphi die? She has wings, and I'm like, what did she drink a Red Bull or something? In so the she's play? an like, augury. Ar- oh, augury? Yeah. Okay. Right. She's like a, this omen of death, which honestly makes so much sense. I being mean, Bellatrix and Voldemort's child, but like, yeah, I don't know. JKR really went off on that fanfic. <laughs> Is Delphi yeah. still alive at the end of Cursed Child? No, she doesn't. Does she, like die? she dies. No, I read the script once, and then I saw the play once, and then I. It's gone. You were like, I've had <laughs> enough of this. Mm-hmm. I have seen it in person twice and I did enjoy it in person, but reading mm-hmm. it is absolute garbage. Yeah. Garbage, flaming mm-hmm. hot trash. Yeah. No, for sure. But thinking about Bellatrix as a mother, now that we've all accepted it, I know it's difficult <laughs> because at first I'm just like, ugh, like I can't. Yeah. Is she a mother? She like never sees her daughter. Her daughter is a like, yeah. literal baby baby when she dies right also i can't imagine she's around a lot no like, there's a nanny for sure oh yeah i mean right. she's clearly not spending time with her because she's in the war and then she dies so <laughs> you know what i honestly think is like probably what happened is i probably think narcissa probably raised delphi no she did the didn't manor. they sent her well, was to good. the death eater lady Oh, so there was a nanny. Yeah, they sent her to like <laughs> this like huge Death Eater supporter. I can't remember her name. So you guys are gonna get so many emails about how we don't know anything. <laughs> Sorry, don't know the cursed child lore. <laughs> yeah, we don't claim cursed child. Yeah, because she gets sent to like this crazy like fanatic Death Eater, and that's where she grows Why up. Why didn't Narcissa so raise her? Like I don't even. That see, these are all good questions for the writers. <laughs> no, I was thinking before Bellatrix dies. 
I was thinking that maybe Narcissa takes more of a role until they send her to the fanatic, but maybe they send her to the fanatic like when she was immediately born. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe. But I thought it was interesting (laughs) to think about Delphi as a character Mm -hmm. and to think about the perpetuation of cycles like the one that Morobi mm. grew up in. Obviously, yeah. Morobi's situation was different than Delphi's. They're not exactly the same. But growing up in a loveless environment will mess you up. And oh, yeah. ultimately, we see how that plays out for both of these characters. So I just thought I could give Cursed Child like a little bit of props by making that yeah. comparison. <laughs> I think, though, that we hit the nail on the head. It's safe to say that even if Bellatrix had survived, I just don't I don't see her as a character that would have chosen motherhood. And so I just don't think she would have been Mm -hmm. active. It it would have been like a very cold relationship one way or another. Yeah, it's I can't imagine. It feels very much like it was motivated by her wanting to have like a physical tie to Voldemort. Right. Or to give him an heir because that's Ugh. what he wanted for some reason. Like she would have just willingly given the baby up. Yeah. Her being like, I can do this for you, my lord. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I was thinking that like maybe there was a draw to for both of them, this idea of combining their power and having an heir that was very magical and very strong. Cause we know obviously both of them are very capable, um, you know, wizard and witch. So there could be that element too. I just think Bellatrix, yeah, absolutely never wanted to be a mom. Her mom was definitely not a great mom given what they went through growing up. Yeah. And then I guess they'll have a three quarter blood child. Oh, Lord. Mm. I mean, that seems like something that, that would yeah. matter to them. <laughs> no. Which- Here's the thing, though Bellatrix never knew that Voldemort was a half blood. No. So, like, she would think that it's a completely pure blood child. Oh my god, you're right. Yeah, I yeah. totally forgot about that. Like Voldemort kept that kept that on the DL. He kept that on the DL. Um, so Bellatrix had a child that wasn't pure blood. Wow, she's rolling in her grave in her <laughs> literally <dusty> grave. <laughs> so I mean, obviously, uh, Bellatrix is not someone we would call a a good mother. Maybe not even. Someone would be comfortable giving the label mother at all on the basis of the conversation we're having. Legalize what Gillyweed said. Bellatrix might be a mom, but she will never be a mother, which like reminds me of that. I guess it, it's usually flipped, right? But it just like, yeah, she might have had a child, but she never did anything to, you know, care for or raise. So. I remember once seeing like back in like 2006, a, some potter fan art comic of like what if bellatrix had a child and it was like bellatrix and narcissus standing there and bellatrix's son is like playing with a crocodile and narcissus looks <laughs> horrified and, Bar- and bellatrix yeah, is like yeah he's a right. good kid and like so when i read first child and she became a mother i was like that's where my mind went to her letting her kid play with a crocodile and being like yeah he's a good kid i'm also just thinking like didn't harry have a, a vision too of like her um training draco and like yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah so like if you think about it, just like that he's blood he, that's his yeah. sister that's her sister's kid and even though he's being treated as an adult by the time that happens like i just i would relate that to like what her version of motherhood would be she'd be like you need yeah. to toughen up like crucio oh definitely deal with it, Tough love. Know? definitely well Pam, tell me about good mothers, because we just spent some time talking about bad mothers. What role did good mothers serve in this series? I was thinking about mothers a lot when I realized we were going to talk about this. And the conclusion I came to is that at the end of the day, like the the books really kind of make mothers the unsung heroes of almost the entire story. I think they come in. Um, and save the day a little bit more than we maybe think that they do. Um, obviously, you know, like Molly kills Bellatrix, but it's an act of motherhood. She's protecting her child when she does that. Um, and then obviously, you know, the story starts with Lily being a prime example of, um, you know, 
doing this heroic thing. She saves her son and it's it's her last act. So mothers kind of feel like not only the unsung heroes, but there's like there's so many instances where mothers like literally shield or save their children, even like going back to Goblet of Fire, which I know you guys are covering right now. The only reason Barty Crouch Jr. survives long enough for Harry to meet him is because his mother sacrifices herself. She begs for his life, even though she knows what he did. Right. Exactly. Yeah. But it's like the the selfless sac- sacrifice of mothers that and that's the kind of it relates to the real world where like, you know, sometimes people say like, you know, motherhood is a blessing, but it's also like a sacrifice. It's the ultimate sacrifice you can make. Mm-hmm. You're literally giving your life up so that you can your body. Yeah. <laughs> everything to raise your children. Well, a part of me thinks that it's not unsung because of that, because we start the the story off with the example of like motherhood and sacrifice and then the cap with narcissa you know lying to voldemort and saving harry's life like because of draco and because of her child like that's a mother's love once again like starting the series and like essentially in my opinion ending the series or at least the harry you know harry being a horcrux journey um and for me like I think JK puts the most value in motherhood. And I think that every single older woman, especially, but even we were talking about Hermione and I'd argue even in Luna and Ginny, they all have these traits that are motherly. They're all caregivers in some way. And I think that underlying all of this and like the subtext of this, you know, story is that J.K. Rowling believes that motherhood is like the most important thing a woman can do. And I don't necessarily disagree. I think it's brave and I think it's incredible. And But she makes the women that aren't mothers still mothers based on the way that they behave. Even like this is maybe a hot take, but even umbrage in some cases shows like ways that maybe a not so great mother, but you know, how someone would mother. So I think that motherhood is just like soaked into this series and is in every single woman no matter who they are and when you were talking about good mothers pam what came up for me is like okay well if it started with lily like you were saying and ends with narcissa is narcissa a good mother like well, I to draco i think that's subjective but i think what it, it boils down to is the um unconditional love Mm -hmm. So like, we're not here to argue whether like, it's not really like an argument whether like somebody is inherently good or not, but Mm -hmm. it's like a reflection of like how their love manifests towards their children that really matters. That's really kind of like the one thing that absolves even the bad characters. Like when you look at Draco, he has a bit of a redemption Mm -hmm. right in the end. And you could, you probably could argue that's completely because Narcissa loved him unconditionally. Um, and then it's the same even with when you look at Dudley. Dudley is a jerk, but mm-hmm. he also gets redeemed at the end. And there's no denying that Petunia's love for her son is true and is unconditional. Yeah. So he grows up ex- feeling that love. And I think that that kind of is what ultimately leads him to be a little bit more compassionate the last time we see him. And then we also know that like um, as they grow, like him and Harry have like a cordial relationship as adults. Yeah. JK Rowling was relatively a new mother, right? When she started writing these books. So I wonder if that's why this theme is like just ringing so true through the women. Yeah. You know, we, we say, right, what we know. And I, yeah. I wonder if like that sacrifice and that unconditional I, love she was struggled, in everything. Yeah. Not to get too much into the her origin story, but she struggled a lot too. Yeah. Like yep. She was a, a poor single mother. Mm-hmm. And she figured out how to change her situation and yeah. how to give her children a better life. And so I think that that you're I think you're right. I think that that's why we see that kind of manifest in different ways in mm-hmm. the plot. Yeah. yeah, I think there was definitely an influence of writing Harry Potter while also having her baby in a stroller next to her in the cafe. Um, right. And also, we yeah. know the death of her mother was a huge influence on yes. the story. Mm-hmm. On the role of mothers, though, I think there, I think there's a difference between being a good person and being a good mother, and I think there's a difference between being a good mother and a loving mother. 
um ah, wow talk. that was beautiful Meg. Yeah. That's deep. <laughs> it's so true because well, when pam when you mentioned petunia um it made me think of when dumbledore visits the dursleys in the beginning of book six and he says like you were terrible to harry you abused him treated him awfully but at least you didn't do to him what you did to your own son and like Ooh, the dursleys even yeah. have a moment where they're like when did we ever mistreat dudley but it's like they mm-hmm. did by spoiling him and encouraging his bullying behavior. And yeah, I mean, it's kind of like a wonder that he was able to turn around and be like, actually, cousin, you're not a waste of space. Yeah. Which like bare minimum, by the way, like, like bare, bare minimum to say to your cousin who you grew up with, who you treated horribly. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I don't think you're completely worthless. Yeah. <laughs> also, he wants to take him. With him. Yeah, he's yeah. like, with him. That's true. I think that that is like, I mean, that, obviously, we don't want to give too much credit to like badly behaved people, but I do yeah. think that there's something really sweet about the fact that he, at the end of the day, he's like, what do you mean he's not coming? What do you mean, like, yeah. we are going to go and stay safe? What do you mean that he's not going to be safe? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And something I, I feel like maturity is yeah. realizing that Dudley is not the villain in the Dursley no, dynamic. It's his parents. Not even a little. And yep. yes, Dudley definitely owed Harry an apology for everything that happened when they were children. But at the end of the day, his parents were the one responsible. ones responsible. He was emulating behavior that he saw his parents demonstrating towards his cousin. Mm-hmm. So he thought it was acceptable. And Dudley is the yeah. one So you who- actually can't blame him. Yeah. <laughs> To no, a degree. no. And, and Dudley's the one who says, like, I don't think you're a waste of space. And his parents are the ones who kind of just walk away without saying anything. There's yeah. that yeah. beautiful mm-hmm. deleted scene in Deathly Hallows where Petunia's like, you didn't just lose a mother. I lost a sister. But in the books, that doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. She kind of looks at Harry like she's going to say something and then she loses the nerve and just leaves. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I think we see that in draco too and like any of the characters that have parents that are you know not parents that we would consider great or you know in bad situations it's like these kids are learning from somewhere right like they're getting this from someone else and i don't think you can ever fault the kid and the fact that dudley at 17 was able to turn around like says a lot you know yeah. Hello, Wolf in our Discord is saying, I think it's assumed that the cup of tea Harry steps on outside his bedroom was also an attempted act of kindness by Dudley at the beginning of Deathly Hallows. Stop. Why does that make me really emotional? I know. <laughs> I know. So I know. Damn. <laughs> I saw this headcanon that said, you know, like Dudley and Harry made a considerable effort to have their kids get to know each other and to like get the family together. And even though it was sometimes tense that you know they still spent time together as a family and i cried i like dry uh, <laughs> undoing generational trauma you yeah know, like they're mm-hmm. uh, break those cycles yeah i love yeah. that well and they both could have family and harry could have family you know that was related to i just think that's really beautiful mm-hmm. and i i fully accepted it as canon mm-hmm Where's that button? Where's Andrew? <laughs> yeah, no, no, oh, no there sound, sound effect this effect? week. Oh, Unfortunately, man, no, he can add them in post. I declare cannon. There you yeah. go. Make, you make my own. So I want us to also talk about the roles of women as teachers. So got some pretty obvious examples here in McGonagall, Sprout, Trelawney, Burbage, Umbridge, that rhymed. Pints, Hooch, and Pomfrey. I'm sure we can find other examples. I think obviously Hermione is an example mm-hmm. of a teacher too. Um, but again, I'm interested in thinking about apart from teachers, what other roles do these women characters serve and how do they intersect with that of being a teacher? Um, I thought Pomfrey was an interesting one to start with because She's technically on the staff, right? We would consider her a teacher amongst the Hogwarts staff, but she's also playing the role of caregiver 
right? Which overlaps a lot with the theme of motherhood. Mm -hmm. Um, And I I think it's really interesting because she, Pince, Hooch, and McGonagall all have in common that they have no time for nonsense. Like, they very Mm -hmm. much give the energy of a mother who cares and who wants to take care of you and wants to do right by you, but she's not going to take any of your BS. Yeah, Pomfrey especially. Pomfrey has mama bear (laughs) energy. Yeah, like, yeah, she yeah. is totally. one of the few characters who we see who will step up to Dumbledore even and be like, "Get out of here! These children yeah. are healing. Go have your plot points somewhere else. Let them rest." <laughs> I feel like McGonagall does that too a few times. Like stands up to Dumbledore, yeah. and I love that they they're like, "No, these are kids first. And I feel like a lot of the male teachers forget mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Meg, to your point, I think that like w- whenever we see one of the characters go see Madame Pomfrey, she also is like making it vocally clear that behind the scenes in moments that we don't get to witness, she's voicing her concern. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, like she's saying, like, I told them that that the Triwizard Tournament was a bad idea. Like, <laughs> why would you let um, Gilderoy Lockhart bend your arm yeah. like why would you do this this and that you know so whose thought was this yeah exactly I I think ugh, I just wish we had spent more time with all of these women Pomfrey especially just because the act of being a healer for the entire school must have been so much and she must have seen the craziest nonsense in a magic like, school given that Hogwarts yeah. is yeah Hogwarts and is we hear about some of it she's like oh like yeah. thank god they're Growing boobo tubers because now kids won't try to hex their pimples off. And remove their nose instead. (laughs) Me. I'm sorry. That would have been so me. I would have, the second I got a wand, I would have been like, okay, so how do I remove my pimples? How do I like dye my own hair? That would have been my first Mm -hmm. question. (laughs) I think it's really interesting to consider Pomfrey through the lens of the only person at Hogwarts who is concerned with public health. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Real. Yeah. Maybe like loop in a little bit. Yeah. Other than the yeah. two of them, like kind of not at all. Because Pomfrey, the only compliment I feel like that she ever gives another teacher is to loop in. And she's like, oh, someone who actually knows what they're doing. Great. Like, I'm yeah, just imagining her like having to address the whole student body. Like, there's an outbreak of dragon pox. Please, no snogging. <laughs> you know? Yes. <laughs> Real. Oh my god. Just like True. in the high school do, movies. <laughs> do you wonder like did Pomfrey teach sex ed? Like oh. that would fall under her role, right? Or hooch, because she's technically the gym teacher. Yeah. I would hope it's them and not like the heads of houses. <laughs> oh, oh Lord. No. Can you imagine Snape? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, thank you. That is not permitted. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure that's against the rules. Dumbledore has like actually a, a list of educational decrees from before Umbridge came to Hogwarts. Yeah. And educational decree number one is that Severus Snape cannot teach sex ed. Teach sex ed. <laughs> no. I feel like they don't teach it at all, if I'm so no. honest, given how old school Hogwarts is and just like the wizarding world in general. I feel like they have some crazy like you know, tales of the beetle bar, beetle and bard story about how babies come to be. <laughs> Probably. I mean, we never see people like shower, really. We see Harry take a bath like once the what? entire series. What episode was it? It was a few episodes ago when someone was like, yeah, they don't shower. They're just dirty all the time. And I <laughs> was cackling because it's true. Like we don't see them shower. It's not relevant to the plot. Maybe they just like <laughs> Evanesco themselves clean. Well, Oh, Should- that's definitely what boys do at Hogwarts. Oh, nasty. Teenage yeah. boys are gross. <laughs> the idea of just putting on a fresh coat of deodorant being like, that's a shower. You think that there's like, I was about oh to say, is there wizarding deodorant? <laughs> like, or wizarding perfume? There's got to be a spell for that. They've yeah. evolved past solids. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, what about heads of houses? Yeah, I think that like sticking with the mother theme um McGonagall and Sprout are heads of houses and Mm -hmm. that really overlaps with that they're literally like mothering a group of students and they're serving as um disciplinaries and you know um yeah so I think it all kind of like fits right I think that also like I I think that you guys are right McGonagall does like present as more stern i think that like professor sprout 
a lot of times the way she's written comes off a little bit more um, nurturing. Yeah. Maybe it's yeah. the herbology yeah. angle yeah. too. <laughs> like <laughs> gardening, plants. you have to. Eat. Well, if you're tending and you you care for plant plants, mom. then like yeah, plant mom. I think that's where it all kind of goes. <laughs> in. But then McGonagall also has like soft sides to her. I think it's really sweet that mm-hmm. she um, genuinely cares about Harry. She frets over him. She's more nervous mm-hmm. than he is when she, he's walk. She's walking him down to the first task. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. She also like is like force feeding him biscuits, which is such a grandma thing to do. It is. You yeah, know, true. <laughs> she is grandma vibes, honestly. Yeah. Maybe that's more what it is. Like, I have she's... so much love for Professor McGonagall. I think she might be my favorite mother, or not mother, but like older female character in the series. She's in my top, if not top three, top five at least. She would be an incredible mother. Like to my, she doesn't have a child, but I know that she would love so hard and like make sure that that child has such an incredible life and is strong and is you know magical I just I think she would be an incredible mother if I'm honest I think that like I said earlier every single woman in this series has like some sort of motherly slash nurturing tendencies I think that's just how they're written and I'd argue that a lot of women do have those tendencies. Like, why do we think that the mom friend is so common, like, throughout all of our friend groups? And, like, we all care deeply for the people. Like, so I think in, in a way it, it um, parallels real life that all these women, even if they're not mothers, have some sort of caregiving nature aside from, like, a few, like Bellatrix, which is also real. Like, there are some women that, don't have any of it and they don't want to and that's cool too but I I do think this parallels real life I agree and I think it's interesting you know thinking about the mom friend example Mm -hmm. how we can all show up in kind of multifaceted ways depending on the space that we're in so for example I have definitely been the mom friend before in a very specific context in general, though, I don't think I'm the mom friend. No, I, I agree with you. I totally, I mean, like, <laughs> Chloe's you, like, you are not a mom friend. <laughs> no, no, that's not what I meant. No, that's no, not no. what I meant. I, You're perfect no, and I, I love you so much. I am messing with you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but okay, I feel like sometimes you show up that way, but I don't think that is like your overarching no. trait or like where you go. For example, like when I went through a really difficult breakup in October, you actively checked up on me multiple times and was like, how are you doing? And that's such a caring and nurturing thing to do. Obviously you were doing it as my friend and someone who cares about me, but that would like fall under mom friend. I yeah. feel like vibes, but you're not that. You, when we went to brunch, you like insisted on treating me, which I think is also like a way of showing care and nurture in a different way. So I, I think all of us show up that way for sure. Just in our own ways. Yeah. Yeah. It exactly. is all linked to feminine energy of, mm-hmm. and, and there are, there are men who, mother and they exhibit this feminine energy of of taking care and and making sure that everyone is is safe and healthy and and happy too yeah it's the text me when you get home Mm -hmm. energy Mm -hmm. like i think women women do that um i I think it's like it's like almost a compulsory thing that we all do because we all know that it like you know sometimes people don't make it home and we just want to make sure everyone's okay but I, I always feel like that's such a green flag when, you know, yes. my guy friends do it. Like all my guy friends are green flags because, you know, I wouldn't be friends with them if they weren't. Mm-hmm. But it's just it's kind of like, yeah. oh, like, that's so sweet. Like, yes, this is good energy. Text me when you get home. I will do that. Yeah. I also think that there's this component of like women caring for other women because they know how difficult it is to be a woman and exist in this world. Like, I think a lot of us show up maybe sometimes as the mom friend because we know that we want someone to care about our well-being and we want to be cared for. So we're doing that in return. And Meg, I'll give Eric a shout out. Like, he shows up in that way a lot. Like, I think that he does check in on people a lot and does have like a nurturing side to him that I guess we would typically maybe align with more feminine energy. But yeah, absolutely agree. So actually, there is a character um, that I want Meg to make a point about here quickly, who exemplifies just that. Yeah, and uh, it's it's Remus Lupin, 
tying back to where Madame Pomfrey is like finally someone here who actually knows his stuff. It's Lupin knowing to give chocolate to everyone after the Dementors. He's um yeah. he's got soft energy, he's he's caring, yes. he's he's not one to go charging into situations. He's one to to hang back and, and check on everyone. Um and it's a place where we get we see this stereotype be broken. Um and there are other male characters we see this with too. Uh Hagrid and Newt specifically, I thought of, referring to themselves as mummy yeah. when in relation to their beasts, their pets. I love that. It's so much it's breaking the toxic masculinity that's so prevalent in the wizarding world. And like just fully accepting that they're being the like nurturing and the caregiver. I love that. I love both of those points so much. Yeah. And that we see that like manifest out out um aside from like the creatures that they both care for, right? Like yeah. um, Hagrid, bless his heart. We all know he's not the best cook, but he's still sending Harry rock cakes. You know, he's trying or yeah. he brings him the birthday cake. Um, and he's always checking in on them. Everybody knows he's like, you know, like Harry wanted her money to know that if they need comforting, they can go to Hagrid. Yeah, and he's always going true. to be there. They seek him and I out. Think that's so mm-hmm. sweet. Yeah, and he he does things throughout the series to, I think, try and mediate as well when he senses things are off with the trio. I mean, think about Prisoner of Azkaban when Hagrid sits Harry and Ron down and he's like, come on, she's your friend. Yeah. And I think as a society, we typically wouldn't expect an adult man to step in and say something like that in defense of a teenage girl. Right. So Hagrid really does defy those expectations. We also have to believe that it's not um, it's not a unique experience to Harry, Ron and Hermione, because when Rita Skeeter tries to paint him as dangerous because, you know, he's half giant, Dumbledore says that he got, you know, hundreds of letters from parents saying if if I fire you we will raise hell. And so like that yeah. kind of shows that he's he's been filling that role at Hogwarts for longer I, than the well, trio have been there. I think there's a line in Chamber of Secrets where he talks about having Ginny round for tea also, like without yep. her brother yeah. Ron being there. He just collects yeah. strays. Mm-hmm. I feel like he probably does pay attention to who is, you know, making friends and who's having a hard time. Also, Neville like really tries to stand up for him against Umbridge, like to the best of his ability in the fifth book. And like obviously Neville was terrified, but he, you know, tries to be there for Hagrid. And I think there's probably examples there. And I definitely think he does it for the Gryffindors for sure. Mm-hmm. Well, I want to talk about the roles of women in war as well. This is something we've touched on a little bit in the past on the show, but I thought it could be interesting to look at the light side versus the dark side and what roles women on either side of this war, uh, what roles they fill and maybe what roles can be represented on either side of the war. I think we've seen that motherhood is one of those, right? Yeah. I just, while we were talking about this conversation and I like framed this earlier, I was really thinking about how, yes, all of these characters have some sort of like motherly trait, but on top of that, a lot of them are warriors. Like Molly Weasley is a mother. That is her main thing. That's what we see her do. And she's a good mother and she's good hearted and kind. And she's also an incredible badass witch. And she fights in that battle of Hogwarts and she kills one of the most powerful witches, you know, on the other side. She is a mother. She is caring. She is lovely. She is a warrior. I also think of Fleur, who's the same thing. Like she is beautiful and feminine and also a warrior and fights. And I'd argue she also has motherly traits when she, when, you know, the trio's at Shell Cottage and she's taking care of all of them. Um, so I think that JKR, to her credit, does write these women in a way that makes them like makes them just as powerful as the men, in my opinion. And I wish that we saw more of them. That would make me happy. But at the end of the day, they are all very capable to fight as well as to nurture. Yeah, this makes me think of Hermione also. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. 
But yeah, Hermione is, she's so smart. She's so talented, so capable, Mm -hmm. but she also cries a lot. She's emotional and it's nice to see that someone can be both of those things. Oh, that's so real. That's so real. (laughs) <laughs> and she can also be wrong. I mean, Hermione's off sometimes. And that's love it when she's wrong. Yeah. And that's that's something I actually really do appreciate about the way many characters in the story are written. I mean, you look at characters mm-hmm. that you're really, I think, predisposed to like overall, but they're still pretty flawed. Um, you know, yeah. D- Dumbledore, the biggest among mm-hmm. them, since <laughs> Andrew isn't here and he can't defend Dumbledore this week. I even think about, we were talking a lot about how JKR last time writes like interesting things regarding traditional femininity, but in, on the opposite token, Lavender and Parvati, they joined Dumbledore's army. Yeah. Yes, they are super girly and giggly and traditionally feminine. And I think, unfortunately, the author makes them annoying and I'm like doing little, Air what quotes. is this called? Air quotes. Air quotations. (laughs) Um, But they're also willing to fight. They join Dumbledore's army. They want to protect themselves and other people. And that's pretty awesome. They fight in the Battle of Hogwarts. And depending Mm -hmm. on what canon you believe, Lavender even gives her life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm still in that vague, uh, I don't know what happened. Oh, she's totally alive. Because I love her so much. Lavender's alive in my mind. Yeah, she just likes her steaks raw. (laughs) <laughs> like Listen, Bill. exactly. Yeah. The rule, I feel like the rule of any franchise is unless you see a body, unless it is unequivocally communicated that they are dead, they're not dead. No body, no crime. Exactly. No. And also like, <laughs> yes, Meg. <laughs> Come on, Taylor Swift. She had to pop up. Look, <laughs> hey, look at Harry. He died and he came back. So mm-hmm. like, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. He did it twice. <laughs> yeah, he pulled a Jesus. <laughs> yeah, for real. Legalize Gillyweed says lavender is living in an all women's werewolf colony. Hard hands. <laughs> that sounds like my. That sounds like my dream. I'm not gonna mm-hmm. lie. I love that. Where can Where can I sign up? That sounds great. I also want to call out Lindsay, who said, "I think the women." Uh, are seen having the burden of making hard decisions that they believe Mm -hmm. will impact their children's future. And that's so true, right? Like, even when we're talking about, and this is where we can shift to talking about the dark side, but look at someone like Narcissa, who's like, you know what, my son's future is more important to me than my ideology. I, I was about to say, I feel uncomfortable putting her in the dark side. Because of that. Tell me about that. Yeah. (laughs) I, I don't think she has a side except Draco. Like, that is her side. I think that Narcissa, because she met Lucius, ended up being on the bad side. I think she probably could have gone the same way Andromeda went if she hadn't met him. She followed him. She followed her family. And she does have that unconditional love that Pam was talking about earlier. So for her, it was anything to preserve her family, anything to preserve Draco. And that ended up with her being on the dark side. And I think by the end of it, she realized that being on the dark side was no longer going to save Draco and her family. So she got out and she made that change. Like, I I just like, I don't think she picks a side except self-preservation and her family's preservation, which is very slither end of her if I'm honest. Yeah, you could you could argue that Narcissa leads with love. Like she loves her family and that's why she finds a nice pure blood man to settle down with. And then yeah. she loves him mm-hmm. and that's why she, you know, is is agreeing with him on these political topics. And and then she loves mm-hmm. her son and she's ultimately she makes her choice based on that. Yeah. Yeah. But I guess if we're making it especially in talking about the Wizarding War, we know that it heavily parallels to World War II. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, there were plenty of people just like Narcissa yep. during World War II who maybe themselves weren't necessarily Nazis to their cores, but they sure rubbed shoulders with the Nazis and they broke bread with the Nazis and they were down with the Nazis as long as it was convenient for them and it wasn't causing any issues in their life i think that is who narcissa is yeah yeah a hundred percent yeah 
I would amend my statement. She she leads with her personal love, the people she loves. Yes. She does not lead with yeah, a love yeah, for yeah. humanity or what is right. I agree with that. I think very few characters lead with that. I think most of them lead with love for their family or their like or yeah, their their loved ones. Yeah. I mean, I feel like with within the trio, Hermione is really the one who leads with yeah. the most love. Yep. Of the three of them, even just thinking about her love of humanity, love of yeah. justice, mm-hmm. love of fairness. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And I mean, just thinking about her approach towards Spew and house elves, um, you know, she, as we've discussed many times, she's not exactly going about it in the most effective mm. way, <laughs> but she's doing what she knows how. And Mm -hmm. she's standing up for somebody that she really doesn't have to stand up for. I mean, her life is probably going to be easier at Hogwarts if she isn't sticking out like a sore thumb as that weird girl with the spew buttons. Yeah. Shaking the badges under everyone's (laughs) nose. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But I love that about her, though. She's so unapologetically herself and she believes so fiercely and it's so beautiful. Like, I, a part of me wishes that I was like that when I was growing up and I cared way less about what other people thought and cared way more about like what I was doing and what I was trying to accomplish because it's brave of Hermione. Mm-hmm. And honestly, that's like a big part of the Gryffindor in her, like to me, is the idea that she just barrels on and she doesn't care. Like, she does not care what other people think in the in the way that like, I think, I mean, I think she cares a little, but she doesn't care enough about what other people think to stop. Mm -hmm. She's going to keep going and she's going to fight on. Yeah, that's why she's a warrior to your Mm -hmm. point. Um, But I want to keep us focused on the dark side. Uh, And I think, Meg, you had put in a really interesting name origin here as we're talking about these women. Yeah, I had a note about Bellatrix because... When I saw roles of women in war, including Bellatrix, I remembered that Bellatrix literally means warrior. Um, And in verifying this, I actually learned that the word Bella, just Bella, has two meanings in Latin. It can mean both beautiful and the plural form of bellum, meaning war. So Bella becomes beautiful warrior, which is really an oxymoron sort of in terms of femininity taking the word beautiful, which is so, you know, supposed to be so soft and lovely and glorious, and then warrior, which war is, it's ugly, it's harsh, it's sharp. To her, it probably is beautiful, though. Yeah. Yeah, I was about to say, Mm. there's that, and also the idea that, like, she is probably Voldemort's, like, number two guy, maybe. Like, she is his beautiful warrior. Um, And she is beautiful. And she, like, we know that canonically in the story, and she uses that. I mean, I think it's the, so fitting of a name. <laughs> mm-hmm. So we chatted a little bit about the the light side and the dark side, but are there any female characters that we think are left out and really don't get to pick a side? Apart from Narcissa, I, we have that on the record that Narcissa is kind of <laughs> like maybe ambiguous. <laughs> I was just saying by not picking a side, though, she is picking a side, Uh, right? Which is the truth of like anything, you know, if you're not fighting for good, you are complacent and evil, which is with what you were saying about like Nazi sympathizers and people that didn't do anything during World War II. Um, I just think that her story is complicated and there's a lot of conversation in the chat happening right now talking about like how likely it was that she was also an abusive marriage. Yeah. considering how Lucius treated Dobby and how he potentially treated Draco as well. Like, I feel like Narcissa was doing everything she could within her means. And that's the other thing. Like, I don't think it would have been possible for her to get out. She has, she went from her father's house to her husband's house and um, she's never known anything else. And I think that there is like just a lot more nuance with Narcissa than just like putting her in like bad, mm. yeah, evil side. Yeah. <laughs> I get it. I think, uh, similar to Narcissa is Merope and that she is a product of her environment. But um, but unlike Narcissa, Merope doesn't even go to Hogwarts, so she never even gets to see the other side. Mm-hmm. She It's kind of implied that she just grows up only having interactions with her father and brother who tell her, you know, muggles are scum. You are 
a worthy person because of your bloodline. Um, and so she really doesn't have a chance to ever get to form her own opinion. And it just goes to show how important education really is in getting a good rounded view of the world. All right. Well, we are going to be coming back to speak about the role of women in fandom. But first, we need to take a quick break to listen to these messages. All right. And we are back. Now we want to pivot to talking about the role of women in fandom. Obviously, all of us have been in fandom for quite some time. So we want to talk about our place in the Harry Potter fandom, what it's looked like, what our contributions look like at this point in time. But we also want to talk about some of the prominent initiatives that are led by women in the Harry Potter fandom and ultimately how the Wizarding World fandom has created space for all kinds of people. Um, So I thought we could get started um, by talking about how we currently interact with and contribute to the fandom. Obviously, a big part of that is this podcast, right? Um, (laughs) We we all contribute to this podcast in one way or another. And obviously, those are really significant things. But I would wager to guess that there's a lot of interaction that we have with the Harry Potter fandom that isn't necessarily always captured on this show. So I'm just curious to hear from y'all in what ways are you engaging with the Potter fandom outside of podcasting these days? Well, I have been a volunteer with MuggleNet for 11 years now. Um, oh my oh God. God, what? I know, I know. I yeah, didn't know Social that. media copy editor. Wow. I, I make sure that whenever people, you know, have a, a tweet scheduled about Dame and Maggie Smith, that it hasn't accidentally been autocorrected to Damn Maggie Smith. That happened once. And then they brought on <laughs> me. So uh, so I make sure that things are just ni- nice, and, nice and neat over there. Um, but yeah, I... I spend a lot of time with MuggleNet. Um, I it was my homepage in like 2005, and that's how I first Same. heard about MuggleCast. And then I saw they wanted a, a podcast transcribers in 2012, and I applied, and that's how I kind of got started there. And then they wanted a social media copy editor. But I mean, I remember when I first encountered MuggleNet. I remember it being very much a boys' club, and listening to MuggleCast, it was like just entirely boys plus yeah Laura. um <laughs> yeah look and how look at how far we really now we really but, have. but also <laughs> for like over a decade now MuggleNet has been like majority women led and since 2017 mm-hmm. like leadership has almost exclusively been women um and we even we did a demographic survey a couple years ago and we found that about 80 percent of MuggleNet staff are women and the other 20% are 10% men and 10% non-binary people. And it's just oh. such a far cry from what it was back in 2004, 2005. Um, Seriously. And it, and I, I just see the discussions that we have there and we're, we, we bring ideas and we're smart and we're funny and we're the ones keeping it going. Yeah. And I think it's so interesting Comparing those demographics to the demographics of the fandom, I think it's fair to say that while Harry Potter fans come in all packages, right? Um, when you think about the fandom, the people who are most active, the people who are showing up at conventions, I'm not discounting men who show up, um, but you're talking about an overwhelming majority of women, at least in my experience. I kind of remember this being a little bit of a joke back when I was a teenager and going to Harry Potter conferences, uh, because me and my friends would be like, oh, maybe we'll meet like a guy there (laughs) at the convention. Won't that be like hot and fun? And then it was like, okay, well, uh, there is like a ratio of 10 to one yep. of men and women at these conventions. And the guy's probably gay <laughs> was the other thing. Real. Uh, it's just like going to art school. <laughs> oh, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. I can imagine. My college experience was very much like a like a Harry Potter convention. <laughs> that sounds great. I feel like going to Harry Potter convention with the Muggle cast boys, like 
all the girls were like low key after them probably. So you were like, I, what do I even do? What's going on? Like it was actually kind of nice because I'm like introverted and shy and I no, I meant yeah. like there was no other men so like oh, you're not finding anyone I see. Yeah. Well, there, there were other men for sure um but at least in my experience it was nice that they were getting all the attention because they really so were you could like do your own thing yeah, yeah just hang back and yeah, yeah chill yeah but I had some really great conversations in small groups with women again at these conventions. Yep. Like you tend to just gravitate towards like-minded people in general. Yeah. And then it's it's just a place of community and gathering that I yeah. I'd never experienced before. <laughs> I mean, two of my now best friends I met at LeakyCon last year. And they're women and like it was because we were able to connect on like such a deep level. And I think the conversations that we can have as women are very different than the conversations that, you know, we have with men. And that's just the reality. Well, what about you, Chloe? What does fandom look like for you? Uh, Yeah, I mean, I like live in fandom at this point, which is so great. It takes up the majority of my time in life and I'm so, so endlessly grateful that it's become actually a big part of my job um, through MuggleCast and those Forking Fangirls, the other podcast I work for. Um, I've made incredible friendships in the Harry Potter community and then beyond in other fandoms. Um, I read fanfics pretty much daily. (laughs) I meet up with my Harry Potter friends on the regular. I've made friends like through Harry Potter social media. Um, And I also create content for fandom myself. And I don't know, like it makes me so happy. And I don't think there's anything wrong with it. And I think that's like why Miriam Margolis, Margolis, I don't know how to say it. Margolis, yeah. Margolis. I think that's why her her comments hit me so hard because it's like, it is a lot and a huge part of my life. And without it, I would be a much more sad person. Um, So fandom has given me so much and I will continue to live in that space because it makes me so happy. And it's okay if you do too, by the way. (laughs) Yeah. Honestly, I just feel sorry for her if that's her perspective. Like, yeah, real. Being so real because I'm, she didn't read the books, right? She was just in the movies. So, yeah, she was just in the movies. She just had exposure to like the early movies. So, that's her interpretation of what Harry Potter is. She's missing out on like 85% of it. And that's her loss. So, you know, think whatever you want. Miriam. Mm-hmm. Love you though. Like she's a she's a Charles Dickens fangirl. And that's good for her for yeah. Harry Potter fangirls. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Eric and I were texting about that. <laughs> I was like, oh, so she has her own thing. She's just maybe <laughs> mm-hmm. judging ours. Yeah. Right. Well, her thing is like written, it's old and it was written by a white man. So there's probably some commentary we can draw there about yeah. like <laughs> the perceived um legitimacy or validity of an artwork depending on where it came from and who it came from but you know whatever like what you like um mm-hmm. still adore her though like i think she's hilarious but on she's so very funny. funny on this one yeah. i was just like eh, you don't know what you're talking about i'm just, just like <laughs> yeah like just don't steal other people's joy is like yeah. my big thing yeah like just like we won't steal yours and your like dickens love fest <laughs> That's a weird sentence. <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> hey, you know what? We we get unhinged here on the girls' takeover episodes. Um, Pam, I want to hear about your experience with fandom because I think, like all of us here, you know, we still spend a lot of time in Harry Potter, so we can chat about that. But I also want to hear about just what does fandom look like for you in general? Because I know Harry Potter is not the one and only thing that we all love. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's funny because I was, uh, we have a listener. I think she listens to MuggleCast too, Morgan Levy. She has a podcast called That Nerd Thing. And, yeah, um, her podcast is all about unpacking this question like, what does fandom mean to you? How, how do you keep fandom in your life? And so I was on her show and I was basically telling her what I'll tell you guys now, which is that I just feel like I, I really owe, my career in a lot of ways to fandom because Mm. fandom 
um, has always kind of allowed me to dive deep into the things that I I'm passionate about. And then I was able to go to school for journalism and coming out of that too, wanting to write about pop culture. So much of my fandoms and the things that I love overlap with the things that I've covered in my career and the things that I still get to talk about. So I I think that in that way, fandom is kind of a part of my everyday life to different degrees. But for Harry Potter specifically, I definitely consume I, I've started consuming in the last few years more Harry Potter content online. And I think it's just because we've seen like a resurgence in creators creating content around Harry Potter for a while. Like that was really dormant. But, you know, you have like TikTok with like all these Harry Potter creators that are on there doing really creative things. And um, also like um, there are people that start rewatching or rereading the books over on YouTube. And so it's really easy to just tap into these new people kind of experience and experience like the joy that you may be found the first time around reading the books through their eyes, even if they're reading them as an adult. Um, so, yeah. So um, anytime I'm consuming content, though, I do try and like at least like like it interact because spoilers, um, people will make more of the things that you want when yep, you do real. that. <laughs> and I will also um, tie fan fiction into this because I, I do still dabble in reading fan fiction here and there. And I always make sure to hit that kudos button. Yes. If I, if I don't have time to leave a comment because you can leave you know, an unregistered comment on archive of our own, at least hit the kudos button. Like yep. if you want another chapter, you better interact because these people are doing it for free. So just like that's oh, the least you I can do. I have to hit the kudos because I'm like, it's not done. I rarely, rarely pick up a fic that's not like completed. Yeah. And when I do, I'm always heartbroken that I can't read more. So I'm hitting that kudos. Yeah, and even when comments. it's done, like just interact. Like even if no, like yeah. you're just commenting to be like, hey, I like this. And that goes for like TikToks and stuff like that too. Mm -hmm. Like encourage people mm -hmm. to make more of the things that you like because that that is really what keeps fandom alive. What Pam is saying is comment on our stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, and tell be us here to keep making it. <laughs> yeah. True, but, but also yes. yes. <laughs> well, and I think to the overall point about women in fandom, you know, again, we're not speaking in exclusives here, but so many of these creators are women. And yeah. when, you, when you think about the fact that oftentimes they're doing this for free, I mean, it's people who are doing free work because they care about the thing yeah. so much. So yeah, I mean, the least any of us can do is be sure to engage with the content mm -hmm. that we like and not just take it for granted. Like it's always going to be there. Right. So I love that. Mm -hmm. Well, what are some prominent initiatives led by women in the Harry Potter community? Meg, you brought up MuggleNet and how the demographics of his staff have changed quite a bit. It was so crazy to hear you talking about that because I remember working on MuggleNet back in the day and it's a lot different. Uh, the staff page. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the staff page yeah. looked a lot different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's wild to see how it's yeah. changed and developed over time. I'm curious, what do you chalk that up to? I don't know. I, I hesitate to say, you know, like, oh, women are just more passionate. They they care more. Um, it's difficult. It make it it is something that I wonder about a lot. Is like, why did this change happen? How did this change happen? Yeah, I really don't have an answer to that. I'd love to hear what other people think. Mm -hmm. I think it's reflective of that fandom itself. If I'm super honest. Well, it is now. It is now. Yeah. 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 Cause I think well, women have always like been the backbone of the Well, Harry that's what Potter I'm fan. saying. Like, yeah. That's what I'm saying. I feel like this fandom has always been majority women. Yeah. And now Muggle MuggleNet reflects that, which I think is wonderful. I think that you to reflect the fandom is doing something right. Yeah. It's interesting though, because like thinking back to, you know, Maybe when we first discovered websites like MuggleNet or even some of these other like bigger Harry Potter websites that were around in the early 2000s, so many of them were spearheaded by men. And so like if you just existed online, like like Laura, I didn't even realize that the fandom was 
majority women until I started going to conventions. And then you get to see the actual demographic and you realize that like, it's kind of crazy that men are running these, like predominantly men are working on these sites or like making these podcasts Tana's or whatever, because time, it's though. like, yeah, because yeah, it's like, but there's so many women. Like, where there's, are the yeah, women? there's probably so, something yeah. to be said for like back in the early thousands when websites, fan sites were first yeah. becoming a thing. STEM was very much like encouraged for for boys Geared to do. Men. Yeah. And oh, so that's teenage true. boys were the ones who were learning coding and how to make fan sites more so than the fans mm. who were girls. Meg, I actually think that could be a really big part mm-hmm. of it. Why yeah, we yeah. saw the shift happen. That's nuts. Yeah. Y'all are y'all activated. Also some- just core the memories confidence. for me yes <laughs> of of men yeah. <laughs> and them always being able to like kind of do what they want and men i think before often got told yes mm-hmm. more yeah it's Maybe. funny because on the flip side thinking about fan fiction like mm-hmm. i feel like the majority of the people that i interact with um, on the fan fiction side of fandom, and this has been the case since I started reading fan fiction, are are women or yeah. identify as women or non-binary. It's very rarely that I come across something that was written by a dude, which is not to say there are not men that write fan fiction, but it is interesting yeah. how that there's well, like a, you know, like there's always kind of been like that dichotomy there. Even like reading fanfic, I'd argue like, I don't really know. And I have quite a few men in the Harry Potter fandom that I'm friends with. That sounded weird. Quite a few men in the Harry Potter. <laughs> what I loved I was the, like, I have quite a few yeah. men in the no, Harry Potter. I, 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 I didn't mean to say that. I did you not find these men? I know. Wrote. I did not mean to say that. Oh, my God. I meant to say I have a lot of friends who are men in the Harry Potter fandom. And I feel like they don't read fanfic at all. And I feel like all the women do. So I wonder if there's like, I don't know why there's that discrepancy there, but like, they're also not reading it. Do we all read fan fiction here? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The four of yeah. us, yeah. So that tracks. Said this, your Rex. For sure, <laughs> for sure. I will say that I'm definitely more of a dabbler. Like, I'm not, mm-hmm. I don't think I read as much fan fiction as Chloe does, but um <laughs> Every, you know, every now and then I'll read something. And I used, I mean, I used to freaking moderate fan fiction. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I wrote and the things a ton you've of seen, it. Laura. Oof, the things yeah. you've seen. Um, Unsavory I, things. <laughs> I go through phases. I go through fanfic phases where I'm like reading so much for like a month and then I'm off it and then I go back. Like right now I'm focused on Akatar. So like I'm not reading fanfic, but I'm sure soon I'll get back in like a fanfic kick. Well, I mean, I think yeah. a, a lot of the uh, the stereotype of fan fiction being read and written by women is because there's there's romance there. Fan fiction is really a place where people can uh, mm. engage in in romance. Um, but but it it makes me think of like in like Jane Austen novels. It's it's she often writes about how like. 200 years ago if you read fiction that was like a womanly thing to do and like men didn't read fiction mm. men men read nonfiction serious books um and just think about how, how that's changed over the past couple centuries mm-hmm. yeah. can i do like a shameless ask of our listeners yeah, yeah. if you have luna times harry fanfic or you want to write that Please hit my line because there isn't <laughs> enough and I'm begging for it. Like I I really just desperately need more Luna Harry in my life. Um, yeah. So that's that's something I'd like. So <laughs> slide into my DMs if you have Rex. <laughs> slide into the DMs with Valeri. <laughs> yeah, with Valeri. <laughs> for real. They are not There's- written about enough. And I think they're so freaking cute. And you know how I feel about them. You know what's also fun? You, you know, you guys know that Larry's already a ship, right? Oh my god, it is. I wasn't even for, thinking for of the one direction. Direction. Yeah, so they can't be Larry. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um who knows? Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Pav Pavgood, um Lauder. There we oh, go. Well, Lauder is maybe the best. But it's still gross. Yeah. We'll we'll have it. to think on that. It's definitely <laughs> yeah. honestly it's the best ship that never sailed 
Like, yeah, to this day, mm-hmm. I I was so convinced in Order of the Phoenix. I was like, yep, end game. So right was here. Daniel Radcliffe and <laughs> Ivana Lynch. They talk about yep. it in an interview and they're like, we thought we they were going to get together. They played it that and way. I was like, yeah. Yeah, which broke my little freaking heart, by the my, way. My somewhat Anyways. controversial <laughs> opinion is that Harry and Luna would be so cute as like that early teenage romance. But yeah, I feel like totally feel free yeah. to cut this out, Andrew. But I feel like later in life, they just would not be sexually compatible. Like, I feel like <laughs> Luna Luna is either completely asexual, just doing her own thing, or she's like way like experimental, like and, ha- and that it's either way. Harry somewhere just like smack in the middle of that. And it's just wouldn't work middle. out. Totally. Meg, that's, I that's agree with take. you. Oh, man. Absolutely. I, I feel like we could have an entire bonus uh, MuggleCast episode we about should. that. And we probably should. Um, I feel <laughs> I feel very inspired now. So if y'all ever want to come back for a bonus, let's do oh, it. Oh, I'm so down to talk about ships in a bonus. Head y'all cannons. have no idea. That's so real, Meg, though. Like, you popped off with that one. Honestly, it's... Yeah, that's what I feel. <laughs> I, I know it's just it's a gift, honestly. Meg, <laughs> you just like have the best takes and the best one-liners. My my collection of head cannons. Oh, so did anyone else have like a Harry Potter Pinterest board where they like saved or like your Tumblr? I did on Tumblr too, where you like saved or reblogged your head cannons. I'm sure not me. You can find mine out there. Um, reblogged a lot of spicy and weird takes i'm sure (laughs) (laughs) well i wanted to be sure before we get into wrapping up this episode to give some love to fandom forward and leaky con as organizations that are largely female led that are doing great work in fandom um so fandom forward is actually formerly known as the harry potter alliance Um, It is not exclusively led by women. It also wasn't founded by women, but many of its leaders at this point are women and non-binary people. Um, It was initially founded to raise awareness about the genocide happening in in Sudan in 2006, Um, but Phantom Forward now focuses on making activism accessible for everyone and is committed to... LGBTQIA equality, gender equity, youth advocacy, racial justice, education and libraries, media reform, and climate change. So they have really extended the reach of the issues that they focus on. And I love that they have a focus on making, um, making advocacy accessible and sustainable for people to be part of um, so that they can allow their creativity and their participation in fandom to also have a positive impact in some of these other issue areas. Tell us about LeakyCon, Chloe. Oh, well, I mean, Melissa and Ellie obviously started LeakyCon and we know her, um, but it's run by a woman and has a majority woman team. And you're also going to see Meg and I there. So yes. shout out LeakyCon. Looking forward to it. <laughs> I've never been to Portland before. I know. We're going to be roomies. We're going to have a sleepover. It's going to be gonna so be much fun. I'm anticipating a lot of really fun TikToks and like fun pics for the socials. Whatever Meg is yeah. willing to do, that <laughs> I, will do it. I, I'm, I'm happy to do it. The content will be good. Absolutely. You're such a you're such a good sport, Meg, because I I am the bane of Chloe's existence because <laughs> No, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. I love you to death. <laughs> uh, the feeling is mutual for sure, but like I'm very much the roomie who would be like, "No, we are not recording a TikTok." I am not doing and roomie. And then I would be like, <laughs> "Okay, I'm doing it alone then." Yeah. <laughs> you and Andrew, man, you're like no pictures, please. No paparazzi. Thank you so much. No can do. Micah and Eric are such good sports about it. Yeah, they and are. I really 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 appreciate it. Um, especially Eric. He's like, "Oh yeah, you want a picture? Mm-hmm. Absolutely." And they're like, "Pope." Like I love it. Um, so it's it's always fun. Last weekend they they filmed a little uh a little LeakyCon teaser. I, I held the camera. I know. I, love I helped it. 
Oh, I bet it, the camera work is impeccable, Meg. I'll pay very close it's great. attention to that. There was one that. moment where I was not paying attention <laughs> and I like fell off the curb. So it like shakes a bit. But like other than that, it's it's real good. No, that's good though. That's it character. Is. That's character. I'm, I was I was glad they were together. And the second I saw them together, I hit them with a yeah. send pics. Well, to bring us home um, on this second installment of Girls Take Over Muggle Cast, I wanted to chat briefly about where the Harry Potter fandom has been successful in amplifying the voices of women and other underrepresented groups, and maybe where we think there's still some work to be done. Well, I just want, I know you guys aren't going to toot your own horn here on MuggleCast, so I'll do it for you. I think that you guys have done yes, a really good job toot, toot. of Aww. bringing on Thank you. women guests um, in the last few years specifically. I know that Andrew and I have talked about that privately because I've also said that I think it's really good that you guys do that. And, you know, he's also mentioned to me privately that if there is an open spot, you guys try to add more female voices Mm -hmm. in because everybody's well aware that there are a lot of female voices that are amplified in the fandom. So I think that's really great. And I also think it's really great that you guys have been having more BIPOC guests on. That's always Mm -hmm. going to be my soapbox because um, minorities are, um, are BIPOC people are just not really represented in the series, but I feel like Mm -hmm. those fans have such interesting and unique takes. And a lot of times, whether it's because of the algorithm or other powers that be, I feel like those voices often don't get amplified as much as um, some other voices do in fandom. So yeah, I love hearing from BIPOC fans always and their perspectives are just so valuable. So I'll, I'll extend that a bit further and, I don't like mean to make you blush or anything, but I think Laura, you've been that for a lot of women. You have been that representation in the Harry Potter space and the person that they can look up to and like really see themselves in. And you are always so welcoming and kind to guests and you really make them feel like a part of it. And I think that episodes where guests are on like when you're on as well it's I can always tell a big difference because you make people feel just so comfortable and I think that with a fandom that is majority woman and has been really since the beginning like you have been a huge part of making people feel comfortable I also think like beyond women the Harry Potter fandom and fandom space in general has been much more accepting and inclusive to the LGBTQIA plus community before it was mainstream. And I'm I'm now thinking of like the fandom offshoots, like the Marauders and like um, House of Black and like all these offshoots of Harry Potter that are tied that are based in queer and LGBTQIA plus representation um i'm really proud to be a part of this fandom despite the author and despite you know a difficult maybe history because i think that it is so inclusive and so welcoming and i I, you feel that at in-person events you feel that listening to muggle cast you feel that on harry potter tiktok you feel the heart and soul that this fandom has and it is a beautiful thing to be a part of and um I'm just so grateful for it because it has brought me so much joy since I was little. And I don't think I would be the person I am today without the Harry Potter fandom and the women who are a part of it and all of you. Yeah. I mean, I go thinking I was talking about MuggleNet in 2005 and I was, you know, a teenage girl who loved Harry Potter. My friends were teenage girls who loved Harry Potter. And I go on MuggleNet and listen to MuggleCast. And it was primarily these boys. But then Laura was there and I was like, oh, I see myself yeah. there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Y'all are going to make me cry. <laughs> no. You deserve to hear yeah. it though. Like so many people feel it. And everyone too. like listening knows too that like it's because of you that there is a female voice on the panel. Mm-hmm. You know, like Mm -hmm. I know you've told the story many times that you said, why don't you guys have a girl on? So that I mean, if you'd never done that, crazy that none of them thought of it before, though, boys, it was like boys. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) there's just a lot of boys. I loved the the Hermione moment there, Meg. Boys. Um, (laughs) I mean, in their defense, they were only a few episodes in. Yeah, it's true. Uh, They they were still getting their footing. And I think they would have gotten there. But I was definitely 
the abrasive one in the staff forms being like, like, let's make sure this happens in season one. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I don't know how abrasive it is to be like, hey, maybe get a woman on. I don't know. (laughs) Crazy. <laughs> Cuckoo no. bananas idea, but no, but props to them because like they could have just been like, You're you're psycho. No. Yeah, that's you true. know, so like it like the, the environment was already welcoming to begin with, to your point. So yeah, yeah. It's great all around, but they always were. Yeah. What um I'm curious though, what are some areas where y'all think the fandom might still have some work to do? I still just think like amplifying. I hate to say this again because I feel like no, I agree with you. I was going to say it if you didn't say it. I really just think that we really need to like make space for more Black creators, more Latino, Latinx creators, more Asian creators, anybody that fits in that BIPOC category. I think that those are the voices that we hardly hear from. And and it sucks that, you know, a lot of times like the algorithm does not favor um, creators that look like that. And yeah. I just love seeing more people pop up on my feed. But I know that like it happens because every time I see a creator of color talking about Harry Potter, I'm automatically like hitting the like, leaving a comment <laughs> so that I see more of that. I feel like the biggest Harry Potter creators right now are BIPOC people and it makes me really happy. Like I'm thinking of the people that come up on my For You page all the time and they are part of minority groups. And I think that is freaking awesome. And I think it does show how far we've come. Obviously we have so much more work to do. Um, And you're right. Like this fandom was started by white men, like in my opinion, like just the big fan sites and, you know, the people that we were amplifying in the beginning. And I mean, I think that is true of anything, if I'm honest. So we have a lot of work to do in terms of making sure that women are seen and BIPOC creators are seen and different perspectives are seen too. Like, I feel like it's really important to also have diversity of thought um, when it comes to this fandom and not be in like a constant echo chamber. Yeah. And that's true for everything, right? I think, yeah. (laughs) I think people, people existing in their own personal echo chambers is just a really big problem in general right now. And I think it's something that as a fandom, we can definitely work to avoid by continuing to be more inclusive and more welcoming. So I totally agree. Also, just different views about Harry Potter. Yeah. Like, yeah. Genuinely. Yeah, I think that's important, too. Perspectives that yeah. represent the world. Because the world, yeah. the ant- mm-hmm. Harry mm-hmm. Potter, the fans are from all different backgrounds, races, genders. Yeah. I was thinking about that because I'm, I'm listening to the Harry Potter books in French right now. And just listening to the exact same like story in a different language I get a completely different feeling and I wonder Pam if you felt this like with Spanish books it's like reading them there's a different you get a almost a different layer um and Mm -hmm. I'm sure that's true like living in different countries reading it I'm sure it's a very different experience for my friend Zucanya who is from London reading the Harry Potter books like she probably gets a lot more of the nuances that we don't and like understands the schooling system and all this stuff. Um, just like I'm sure it's different for someone who is in Italy or wherever else. Yeah, I, it's uh, for me, like part of the fun and having read the part of the series in Spanish, not all of it, because I read a lot slower in Spanish than I do in English, is just seeing how certain words get translated. Mm-hmm. Like um, I think that like for Deathly Hall, like the title Deathly Hall is that literally literally translates to relics of death. And like mm. having that, like, do you, I don't know if you guys remember, I'm sure you guys remember like all the theorizing that was happening was with like what Deathly Hall is meant. It's like, what the heck yeah. does that mean? And it's like, but in Spanish, it makes mm-hmm. a lot more sense. A relic of death, you can work towards some kind of like conclusion. Deathly Hallows is almost like shrouded in mystery. No, so, that's real. Yeah. So I think that that is really fun. But like also to that point, like just seeing like the um again, like going back to like the content that's being created on pl- spaces like TikTok and like the way that that has really kind of added a new layer to um, exposing you to like fans from maybe different parts of the world that you wouldn't have interacted with or seen had you not been on a platform like that. It's like, it's so much fun for me to see like content being made 
for Harry Potter in Spanish because like the yes. jokes are different too. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure yes. you've seen that too with like French creators, for example. Uh, what one thing that really cracks me up is when I'm listening is wand is baguette. Yes, in yeah. French. I read the so, first book in French. Yeah, it is. So there's a lot of like really funny things with French that just like crack me up as someone who also speaks English because mm-hmm. Harry's like it, Dumbledore is like Harry. The baguette, and he's like, it's a very serious <laughs> moment. Just imagining it being like an eleven-inch baguette, like that is yeah, the funniest no, visual. So funny, so <laughs> funny, and some of the like teachers' names are like so crazy. Like Snape's name is Grog, which is like so like <laughs> you just Yuck. really like feel it, you know, like Grog. Like even saying it, you're like, ooh, you know. <laughs> That's so funny. I mean, when I think of Harry Potter in French, I think of uh, Voldemort's name being Tom Elvis. Voldemort. Tom Elvis. Yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, that is pretty funny. <gasps> oh, I right. forgot about that. Yep. The things they had to do to make it make sense in different languages. Yeah, they had to yeah. make it make sense. So it's the yeah. anagram would work. Oh, that's so funny. Mm-hmm. That's so mm-hmm. funny. Yeah. I'm sure I think that had to... That had to be a thing in the Spanish edition too, right? I'm trying to yeah. remember. Yeah, I'm trying to I'm think. Sure for most languages, they had to yeah. Google that. Yeah. There's probably like compilations <laughs> online that you could find. Oh, and Hufflepuff, you guys. Poof souf. Poof souf. <laughs> oh, apparently it's El Señor Oscuro. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Wait, his acronym spells El Señor Oscuro? Is that what no, you're that's saying? That's what Pam? someone said. Like, okay. just right away, El Señor Oscuro. His muggle name in French is Tom Elvis Jadusor. That's yeah. Not, yeah. <laughs> in Spanish, it's Tom Sor- Sorvolo Riddle, but Riddle is spelled with a Y. <laughs> <laughs> Very 2024 of them. Yeah, it's like know, a baby right? spelled a Riddle with a Y. Oh, true. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's but so he great. had millennial parents in the Spanish yeah. book. That's so. Fun. Oh wow, this is a fun little rabbit hole. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> I will go down any rabbit hole any day, any time with y'all. This has been amazing and so fun. I really mm-hmm. feel like we could go on and on and on. Um, but I think Andrew will murder me if this audio mm. file gets to two hours. So we're gonna go ahead and. <laughs> wrap this discussion up but there will be a girls takeover part three next time we will actually be doing a chapter by chapter episode so keep an eye out for that we'll definitely blitz the socials when it's coming along and uh, we'll probably give you some reminders ahead of time too because we would love to have you joining us for the live stream and in our discord But next week, chapter by chapter, we'll continue with our analysis of Goblet of Fire, chapter 20, the first task. And now we're going to be getting into this week's quiz itch. So last week's question, what is the first bit of Professor Moody's advice to Harry about the first task? Last week's answer, play to your strengths. Profound. Correct answers were submitted by All Snapes and Sizes, Buff Daddy, Elizabeth K, Green River, Green River Kelpie, Hagrid and Sirius are in a hardcore biker gang and our best <laughs> bros dudes. <laughs> <laughs> Hi to my Ravenclaw husband. Oh, is that for Ooh. Micah? Hey. <laughs> Justice Ooh. for dragons. <laughs> they are unfairly maligned and misunderstood. Katie from Hufflepuff, <laughs> let me tell you the pot- potercularly perfect Harry Potter pun. Yo, that's hard to <laughs> that say. That is really <laughs> difficult. Uh, Lloyd the Kiwi, Mad Eye Fakie's last bit of sanity, must be a Weasley mm. 92. Professor Stumbledore, Proud Ravenclaw, Rita Skeeter's probation <laughs> officer. <laughs> isn't that basically yes. her mind? Oh. I was going to say, isn't that her mind? <laughs> And last but not least, Ron can Weasley his way out of anything. Love that. Eric makes this look so much easier. The way he rattles them off. When he does it every week. Because I'm like stumbling. Does he practice? I think every week is practice. Okay. True. True. I was going to say, we have the inside scoop with Meg here. So it's like, does does he like tell us all his secrets? (laughs) Yeah. I think it's just a talent. I guess when he's picking them out. (laughs) All right. Well, next week's question. 
What color are the Hungarian Horntail's eyes? Submit your answer to us at mugglecast.com slash quizich or click on quizich on the Mugglecast website from the main nav bar. Visit our Etsy store where you can buy many cool Mugglecast items like the cozy comfy combo pack, the beanies and socks, which are so comfy. And you can see Andrew and I posing in them on our socials and a bunch of our listeners. And that pack is at one reduced price. There's also signed album art and wooden cars and t-shirts. So make sure to go to mugglemillennial.etsy.com. And there's also info on our socials. And you can visit mugglecast.com for transcripts, courtesy of me, our full episode archive, our favorite episodes, and to contact us. And if you are enjoying MuggleCast and you think that other muggles would, would too, please tell a friend about the show. And we would also very much appreciate it if you left us a review in your favorite podcast app. This podcast is brought to you by muggles like you. We don't have any fancy corporate or network funding. We are proudly an independent podcast. So here's how you can help us out. If you're an Apple podcast user, you can subscribe to MuggleCast Gold, which gets you ad free early access to MuggleCast plus two bonus MuggleCast installments every month. There's also a patreon.com slash MuggleCast. You'll get all the benefits of MuggleCast Gold plus live streams like right now, planning docs, the chance to co-host the show one day, a new physical gift every year, and a video message from one of the four regular MongoCast hosts. And Chloe, you want to take us home with the social plugs? Yeah, I mean, you gotta. just go follow us. Go follow <laughs> us, y'all. Like, please, every single time I come on here, and if you're not following us already, you're missing out on a bunch of fun, extra content from all the hosts, a sneak peek on our episodes, and just a lot of, like, goofball, fun Harry Potter stuff. So come hang out with us on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and TikTok and Threads. And uh, just as a reminder, I know we shared this last time, but where can everyone find all three of y'all if they want to follow you on the socials? Let's do some plugs. I am on Instagram at Megus, which is M-E-G-G-U-S-S. And uh, my art website is meg-scott-art.com. I do art about nature and mental health and the human body, and you can check out my stuff there. It's all so gorgeous. Yeah. I'll plug for you. (laughs) I am at Pamela Kokobachi almost everywhere except for on TikTok where I am at underscore Pamela G because I tried to make it easier for myself. And you can also (laughs) listen to me every week on Millennial Podcast with Laura and Andrew, 18 plus only, please, because we swear (laughs) over there. (laughs) And it's a lot less PG than it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot less PG, a lot more unhinged than uh, MuggleCast is allowed to get. But come hang out with us over there if you're interested in hearing um, more from me and obviously more from Laura and Andrew. Uh, you can follow me at Chloe Laverson on TikTok and Instagram. Um, also, if you want to hear my voice more, you can check out those forking fangirls. I'm a guest host often. We just published um, an episode today about Avatar The Last Airbender, which was so much fun. Um, but yeah, I create fandom content. And then, like I said, follow MuggleCast, follow Millennial, come hang out with us. It's always a party over here at the it's always uh, a party. The hypeable <laughs> family of podcasts. That's not yes. actually what we're called. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just being obnoxious. Uh, y'all, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much for everyone who tuned in live with us tonight. Thank you so much for everyone who's listened through to this second installment of Girls Take Over Muggle Cast. We will see you in the next installment where we will be doing a chapter by chapter. And we'll see you back with the regular panel for next week's episode. I'm Laura. I'm Chloe. I'm Meg. And I'm Pam. Bye. Bye.